telematics is something that is absolutely intriguing, absolutely terrifying, and we absolutely saw it coming. Big Brother is watching, the famous phrase from 1984, now rings more true today than any other time in history. Here's the word-for-word -word description of telematics according to Verizon. At its core, Telematic Systems includes a vehicle tracking device installed in a vehicle that allows the sending, receiving, and storing of telemetry data. The telematics data captured can include location, speed, idling time, harsh acceleration or braking, fuel consumption, vehicle faults, and more. And when they say more, you can believe it's much, much more. We willingly carry around a tracking device already, our phones, and now we can rest assured that our car is also transmitting more data on our behalf. I think. Barry Morphew will come to find out firsthand what his $80,000 Ford F-350 has been telling the FBI. But first, let's start back on May 6, 2020, when Suzanne sent that fateful text. I'm done. I could care less what you're up to and have been for years. We just need to figure this out civilly. Barry would respond with, I promise you, you are wrong about all the crazy thoughts about me. Why would I want another? Only a fool would stray away from an angel like you. But it was over, no matter what Barry said. At this time, he didn't know that his wife was deeply in love with another man, so the futility of his words were still confusing, starting to eat at him. This wasn't the first time Suzanne brought up divorce, when things were a bit shaky. Yet this time... He could feel it. She wasn't succumbing to his pleas, his threats, guilt trips. He's already used the gun to the head thing. So what was left? Pop quiz. What happens when you don't give a spoiled child what it wants? It gets mad. Same goes for the husband that is described as having a great tendency to overpower and intimidate people, especially his wife, Suzanne whose sweet, passive nature contrasted his personality perfectly. In his favor, of course. But now, he wasn't getting what he wants. He gets mad. On May 10th, Mother's Day 2020, Suzanne goes missing and is never heard from again. Barry is arrested a year later on May 5th, 2021 with the charges of tampering with evidence, attempting to influence a public servant, tampering with a deceased human body, possession of a dangerous weapon, and to add insult to injury, voter fraud. He made Suzanne vote for Trump. For those that didn't hear the question, he said, we're not releasing the affidavit and we don't have a body, so how can I convince the public that we have a strong case? That's my job. I'm the one that considers how strong my case is before I bring charges, and I wouldn't bring charges unless I was confident. The police affidavit was never released to the public, and in a four-day preliminary hearing in front of a judge, we start to see the picture unfold. Let's go back to May 9th, 2020, the day Suzanne went missing. Now, using those pesky telematics as irrefutable data, the preliminary questionings started adding meat to the bones. Barry arrives home at exactly 2.44 p.m. as data shows the driver's side door opens and shuts at their home in Salida, Colorado. For the next three minutes, his cell phone indicates a pattern of movement like running back and forth outside the house, chasing something. Or someone. Oh, you didn't know that advanced GPS texts can track your movements down to, say, patterned running? Yeah, me neither. I guess cell phone tower pinging is so pre-pandemic. Barry would explain that those three minutes were spent shooting chipmunks with his 22 caliber. He brags that he's killed 85 of them. Like that's okay. At 2.47 p.m., his phone goes into airplane mode. Who does that? So what's significant about the timing of all this? Well, just as Suzanne was outside the house sunbathing, taking pictures of herself and sending it to her lover, Jeff, at about 2.11 p.m., 33 minutes prior to Barry arriving home. In all probability, she was still out there when he arrived. Jeff would respond several times to Suzanne shortly after. 
but she would no longer or ever respond again. After four hearings, we learned that detectives believe a tranquilizer gun was used to shoot Suzanne because they would find the cap for a syringe for the tranquilizer in the catch of the dryer. Also, there was forcible entry to the master bedroom door. There were three scratches on Barry's arms, marks on his shoulder, and his hand was injured. Phone records show 59 texts were exchanged that day between Suzanne and Jeff. Now with all this new information, let's paint a more complete picture of Suzanne's last day. Barry came home and saw her sunbathing outside, texting away on her phone. Caught off guard, she probably reacted a bit suspicious. Barry demands to see her phone. Suzanne refuses, and this is where he chased her around for about three minutes. Remember, Suzanne is scared of Barry, in general. She probably feared for her life if he was to see what she's been doing on her phone. She was able to run inside the house and lock herself in the master bedroom. This is where Barry takes out his cell phone and puts it on airplane mode. He gets his tranquilizer gun and heads to the master bedroom. He proceeds to kick the door open and shoot Suzanne with a dart. She still puts up a fight and injures him as he restrains her. He forced her phone away as the tranquilizer started to take effect and likely saw all the text messages from Jeff and maybe even those sunbathing images she was sending him. He would then start to realize that she wasn't only cheating on him, but she was genuinely in love with Jeff. And that would be the last time anyone has heard from Suzanne Morphew. Barry's phone stayed in airplane mode for the next seven and a half hours until 10.17 p.m. Let's rewind back to 4.44 p.m., two hours after restraining Suzanne. Data indicates that Barry enters the truck and shifts to neutral, but then goes back to park and gets out. Maybe he thought better of something he was thinking. Almost five hours later, 9.24 p.m., Barry again enters the car. Parking lights would come on and off. Truck goes in reverse and moves backwards about 96 feet. Now along with the driver door, the passenger door now was opening and closing until 9.52 p.m., 28 minutes of this activity. Then nothing happened until 3.25 a.m. Detectives surmised that DeBerry's truck was being loaded with something, as telematics indicated his truck doors opening and shutting for about 25 minutes. Then the truck would drive off the property, turning in the wrong direction of Broomfield, the city where he was supposed to go in the morning for a landscaping job. That wrong turn was in the direction of where Suzanne's bike would be found the following day. Barry would then switch his phone to airplane mode once again. And then he turned around and started his 150-mile trip to Broomfield. In the 155 miles it would take him to get to Broomfield, it showed him making five stops to discard things. Curiously, stopping at a bus stop to throw things away in a trash can, then at a random hotel trash bin along the route, then at a McDonald's. He stopped in the parking lot of a men's warehouse and stayed for 40 minutes. And once he arrived at the Holiday Inn, he threw some more things in their trash can. Barry would also change his shirt three times during this trip, as surveillance footage indicated. The following morning would be Mother's Day, so everyone including her daughters would be messaging Suzanne, and when she didn't respond, they had a neighbor go over and knock on the door. Everything was quiet, no signs of anything, and that was the problem. A missing persons was filed, and Barry was informed. Knowing he needed to get back ASAP, he contacted a man named Jeff, not Suzanne's Jeff, let's call him Landscaper Jeff, to come down and finish a job offering to pay him good money. With that, Barry started heading home. Landscaper Jeff would arrive at the Holiday Inn Express and enter the room that Barry had been staying in and was met with a strong smell of chlorine as well as several towels strewn about. To him, it seemed that Barry hadn't even slept in the bed as if all he did was shower and leave. He also didn't leave any tools behind, which made it impossible for Landscaper Jeff to get any work done. Needless to say, that pissed them off. The hotel could not account for the chlorine smell also, since they don't use it to clean their rooms, nor was the pool open due to COVID. But we must note that the room was directly above the pool. Now, once Barry was home, he would tell police that Suzanne had been riding her bike. She's been doing that every morning. He also suggests that an animal might have taken her or she was kidnapped. 
or she was killed by someone she knew, like myself, he said. Okay, I added that last part. Her bike was found later that day in rough terrain on a county road near the Morphew home. Detectives noted that there was an absence of skid marks or struggle, no significant damage on the bike. And they also said it looked like it was placed there instead of fallen there. Suzanne's brother David, hearing that Barry suggested an animal carried her away, knew that something was wrong because they were both avid hunters and the simple fact that there was no blood or struggle should rule that out absolutely. And the bike should not look like it was just put there. It should have been mangled. Now let's get into some interesting facts and strange findings that also came out of the four day preliminary hearings. But first, be sure to hit that like button if you appreciate this content and subscribe for further updates on this case. Okay, when police locate Suzanne's bike, there was unknown male DNA on the handlebars and brakes. Suzanne's purse with her ID, credit cards and cash was found in her Range Rover. She also had a cancer treatment scheduled for the following day. In that Range Rover, Unknown male DNA is found in the back seat. Three partial DNA was found on the glove box, which linked to three unsolved rape cases in Arizona and Chicago. We can assume that these have not been elaborated upon because I think everyone is confused about this finding. Barry says his scratch marks were caused by trees when he was searching for Suzanne. Former FBI agent John Grusing said that the day after Suzanne was reported missing, Barry was heading back to Broomfield to see about that job he left, but he again turned in the wrong direction, the same direction Suzanne's bike helmet was found later. Barry claims that he was following an elk, hoping his antlers would fall off. This would be debunked as a lie by Under Sheriff Warwick of Chafee County, stating that the elk do not have antlers this time of year. Now, antlers falling off sounds odd to us that don't know anything about hunting or wildlife. Turns out elk do shed their antlers and you could get some good money for them. Barry explains that the dart gun found in his garage was to shoot deer from his breezeway and cut off their antlers, but he hadn't used it for a while now. Under Sheriff Warwick would state that no cut off deer antlers were found in his home. The dart gun was inspected and found to no longer function. It also appeared to not have been used for quite some time. Surveillance at the Holiday Inn he was staying at did not show anything incriminating. Books and files appear to have been burned in the fireplace. Suzanne's journal is missing, which is believed to be one of the books burned. Barry states that on May 9th, him and Suzanne had a nice night together which included steak and lovemaking to celebrate an early Mother's Day since he had to leave on a business trip to Broomfield later that morning. Investigators were only able to account for one plate and one fork having been used that night. Barry finally admits that some of the stuff he was discarding along the way to Broomfield were tranquilizer stuff. Barry did seek immunity from FBI agents if he opened up about his life with Suzanne. Barry claims that Suzanne was abusing drugs and alcohol for the past two years. Remember how Suzanne failed with a spy pen to catch Barry cheating in part one? Meet Shoshona, Barry's alleged mistress. Now this is an ongoing case and the judge has not yet ruled if there is enough from the hearings to proceed to trial yet as of this recording. Late September 2021, Barry posted half a million dollar bond so he is a free man as I speak today. How he's not a flight risk is beyond me. He certainly has the resources. So make of it what you will, the information I just shared with you. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to keep posted on Barry Morphew's fate, as well as a weekly video on other intriguing stories. If you know a naked baby, well my wife and I run a baby clothing shop at happyedition.com. We design and print ourselves and you will directly support the channel. Here's your guess the punchline. Why did the gay polar bear boy still have sex with the polar bear girls? If you get this one, you're just as stupid as me. <laughs> Peace out.